Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cisco Optics Podcast, where we talk about pluggable optics for networks. Lasers have been around for over six decades. Since their invention, they have found their way into many applications that have changed our lives. Optical communications is, of course, one of them, and there are many that may surprise you. There's also still plenty of room to take laser performance to new heights, leading to even more new applications. This is episode 40, and we continue our conversation with laser and optics expert Juliette Gopinath, professor at the University of Colorado Boulder. Here, she describes techniques she's developed for creating femtosecond laser pulses, including phase-locked laser arrays and time lensing. Juliette Gopinath is the Alfred T. and Betty E. Look Professor of Electrical, Computer, and Energy Engineering and Physics at the University of Colorado Boulder. She received her BS degree in electrical engineering from the University of Minnesota and her MS and PhD degrees at MIT. She was a member of the technical staff at MIT Lincoln Laboratory from 2005 to 2009. Since then, she has led a research group at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her current research interests include ultrafast lasers, nonlinear optics, mid infrared materials, spectroscopy, orbital angular momentum, and adaptive optical devices. She has published 78 peer-reviewed journal articles and over 97 conference presentations. She is the recipient of an R&D 100 award in 2012 and is an Optica Fellow. She served as an associate editor for the IEEE Photonic Society Journal from 2011 to 2017, the associate director for Qubit in 2019, and is currently an associate editor for Optica. Juliet also teaches a free online course on active optical devices. Just go to Coursera.org and search on active optical devices or search on Juliet Gopinath. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast. On Apple Podcasts, you would click the follow button at the top now. We're part of the Cisco Podcast Network. Check out our blog at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics Blog. All one word, no hyphen, and no spaces. You'll find podcast notes and links there too. For our YouTube playlist, go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. And for product information, go to cisco.com slash go slash optics. And now join me as I talk with Juliet Gopinath. on your plate those six pro- okay so that's number three what uh, what would you like to bring up next uh let's see so we still have some efforts looking at ultra fast lasers and i think we're very interested in being able to make short pulse lasers that are based on semiconductors this is okay, really and, really and for people who aren't familiar what, what is ultra fast and short pulse so that can mean many things to many different people. Uh, in in time, maybe there are sort of two main uh, types of lasers. One is a CW laser, it's continuous wave. And so the power is constant as a function of time. The other one is a pulsed laser where you get pulses as a function of time. In my PhD, I used what are called femtosecond lasers. These are 10 to the minus 15 second pulse lengths. And with that, we can do all kinds of fun nonlinear optics, as we were discussing earlier. I think we're quite interested in being able to get pulses that are between picoseconds, which are 10 to the minus 12, to femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15 out of the semiconductor lasers. There are a number of interesting physics uh, concepts that really make it very difficult to do that. And I'm pretty stubborn, and so I like working on hard problems, and this seems to be a pretty hard problem to overcome. Good choice. So, okay, so tell me more about your project here. Um, so we uh, we have looked at different ways to do this uh, for quite some time. And I will say that I was really, my interest in this area was really sparked by my one of my projects at Lincoln Lab. And so when I worked on these slab coupled optical waveguide lasers or SCALs, which I actually think we should have called something more optimistic. Um, Sorry, what, what is, is that an acronym? SCAL, S-C-O-W-L. So that is like a <laughs> frown. Um, okay. So I try to be naturally optimistic. Um, mm. 
But anyhow, my project was to work on generating pulses from them. And wait, so, wait, what does that what does that stand for? It stands for slab coupled optical waveguide laser. Oh, uh, okay. And uh, and uh, so we we did this, um, and we were able to generate picosecond pulses with um, higher pulse energies and higher average powers. And I was really interested to see if one could push this concept further. It turns out that uh, it turns out that uh, some of the phenomena that limit you were probably limiting our scale result. So one main limitation for a semiconductor is the upper state lifetime, and that's basically like how long how long do the excited electrons um, stay in the upper level and are available for lasing. And in the, in the case of semiconductor lasers, it's actually very short. And so what does this do? It actually limits the amount of the maximum energy storage that you can get from a medium. So if my upper state lifetime, for example, is a picosecond and, or, I mean, excuse me, a nanosecond, so let's say it's a nanosecond and I can get a watt of average power, then that means that the maximum pulse energy I can get out of one of these lasers is a nanojoule. And that's kind of a hard limit. I mean, it's sort of difficult to fight uh, to fight nature. Another problem- there are, only so many, there are only so many carriers that are gonna be um, elevated. And then once you deplete them all in a p big pulse, then that's it, right? Is that's that it. the fundamental limit? That is a fundamental limit, and if you look at if you look at fiber lasers, the lifetime upper state lifetimes are on the order of milliseconds. If you look at solid state crystal based lasers, the lifetimes are in the order of microseconds. So that's oh, wow. one issue. Another issue with semiconductor lasers is that we basically make them in a fashion where we have a waveguide that confines the light. And we also have a structure that confines the electrons and the holes so that we can get the light. And essentially, you need to have some material around this waveguide. And the semiconductors are quite nonlinear. And so it turns out you can get what's referred to as two photon absorption. That's essentially you generate this light and then it's surrounded by higher band gap cladding layers. And those photons can be, you can have two photons absorbed simultaneously. And so this can be a major loss mechanism in terms of, in terms of trying to generate mm. short. And obviously the shorter the pulse, the higher the peak power and the worse this effect gets. So that, it's- That two photon absorption is, is that yet another one of these uh like non non emitting uh you, you mentioned early on like mother nature is constantly giving trying to make it harder for you to 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 laze more more power right so the two photon absorption is is just another one of these energy dumps yes it is an energy dump it basically steals the photons that you worked so hard to generate with radiative okay. uh recombination and so you know, that is a huge, that is a huge problem. And then another problem is what's referred to as gain saturation, which is essentially that you can start getting to the point where you have large changes in refractive index. And that is mm -hmm. really undesirable if you're trying to generate short pulses. And so our approach uh, in my lab- Wait, sorry, why is that undesirable? Um, because if you have really large changes, a lot of the theory for pulse generation was done essentially in the, in the steady state. And so mm -hmm. large changes really perturb everything that's going on. You essentially need a new formalism mm -hmm. in terms of generating pulses, okay. which doesn't sound, doesn't sound too good to me. <laughs> it makes it pretty hard, sounds like. Yes. I mean, I think there's a similar for, there's a similar phenomena in amplifiers as well um, that people talk mm -hmm. about. Um, so, so our approach um, initially, 
initially when I joined CU, I was really interested in trying to take an array of lasers, a uh, array of individual lasers, and then basically control the, the frequency and um, the phase and add them all up coherently. And so if you can mm -hmm. do this, you know, it's like, it's like the phase, so controlling um, the frequency and the phase and adding them all up, um, this is the ultimate way to like dial in your, your pulse width and your repetition rate, mm. which is the spacing between the pulses. Um, and so it they're all generating bad. pulses at the same time also? No. So a pulse is made up of a bunch of different colors and those colors all have to be in phase. So now imagine instead of having all those colors from one medium, imagine having individual elements, which each produce these colors and then adding oh. them up in phase and selecting how okay. many of them you want. So, oh. uh, it, but it turns out that you actually need to have these elements spaced very precisely in frequency. And so mm -hmm. that's not easy to do. And then the other thing that's also really not easy to do is now you need to add up all these phases. What are you going to do mm -hmm. if you have 50 elements? Are you going to make 25 interferometers so that you can like lock up the phases? That doesn't sound very good. And so what we were really interested in doing was having a single phase sensitive metric, like the peak power, and then feeding back through uh, an FPGA and using what's called stochastic parallel gradient descent. It's essentially like optimization algorithm to do things quickly and then mm -hmm. feed back all the phases. So we showed for three elements that we could do this. Um, but I think we got very uh, discouraged with the scalability. And so then we decided to look at a new approach, which is referred to as the time lens. And so mm -hmm. if you think about a lens, when you, when you illuminate that with light, then essentially the reason it focuses is it changes the face across the beam spatially. And that causes the light to focus. So now imagine okay. doing this in time. So mm. what we did is we had a semiconductor laser that we turned on and off. And then we sent this through a phase modulator that imparted the same phase in time that a lens would impart on a beam in space. And then if we send this through what is called dispersion, which essentially means that the different colors travel at different speeds or, or different, uh, different speeds, then we can essentially put, we can essentially um, make a really, really short pulse. So we made, a, we made a time lens laser this way using mm -hmm. phase modulator, grading pair, and a few amplifiers. And then we used this to show that we could do brain imaging we could image like a millimeter of brain tissue. And we were excited about this because our laser was a lot smaller than the conventional ti titanium si sa sapphire lasers that mm. people generally use. And it was also a lot cheaper. So we actually recently worked on a follow on to that, which was essentially trying to get shorter pulses and higher powers. And we recently published a paper on that also showing some really nice imaging results. Um, and so we're still, you know, thinking about kind of the next steps. Um, um, but we've, okay. we've been working on, on some new methods for, for pulse shaping. So, so I've been working on this problem in some way, shape or form since 2005. And it's wow. a lot of fun and really dovetails of my interests. Wait, so, Gosh, I forgot what was the problem again? The the problem that you're solving? Just getting shorter pulses? The problem With... that I want to solve is I want to be able to make an electrically pumped ultra fast laser. And one place it seems like there is a home for it immediately is in a neuroscientist lab. Because the neuroscientist yeah. really needs to put effort into into their animal models and mm. and and whatever fluorescent optogenetic markers they want their animals to express and really studying the biology. So the laser is just a tool to get there. And if they are forced to spend $200,000, it's a really high barrier to mm. being able to do science. Not to mention the fact that the Thai Sapphire has like a pretty big footprint. 
And so the dream was to be able to make a compact, ultra fast laser. I mean, I think it's got other um, other applications. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. But that that seemed so, to be some low hanging. That seemed to be like a low hanging fruit as far as an application, and that's really what we were targeting. Okay. And the 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 first thing you described was you had three lasers, different colors, but they were locked. They were like very specific wavelengths so that when you lock the phases together they would generate pulses so it's basically like a mode locked laser where each mode is just an individual laser that you artificially lock with uh this phase controller and fpga that's right that's right was it, it the, just was it the fpga that was the limitation i think it's just a really hard problem like i didn't appreciate how well the how important the frequency spacing was that needs to be mm. really really precise and then uh, the lasers need to be very narrow line width and so it's one of these concepts that looks really good on paper until mm -hmm. you actually start doing it i think another real issue was that there were a real lack of suppliers for individually addressable single mode semiconductor laser arrays so to mm. boil that down into plain english if we're going to do this if we're going to really follow through with this concept we need to have electrical leads coming off each of the elements and that is hard mm. to find because often when people make laser arrays what they do is they make they essentially just have everything driven with a single contact so you drive all uh. the lasers at once and you don't have any kind of individual control and i think that that was a really, that ended up being a really uh, difficult problem to solve. Mm. So you, you would need some kind of a custom array. Yes. Specialized for this application. So, okay, and then the other the other method was uh, you you modulate the phase and then you put it through dispersion so that the 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 difference in the group delay ends up bunching the light into pulses. You need a lot of dispersion for that, right? And a lot of phase modulation. I, I, sorry if I missed it. What what kind of devices did you use? So we used semiconductor lasers, but what we did is we first we gain switched to them. That essentially means we turned them on and off to generate mm -hmm. the initial pulses, which we then sent <clears throat> through phase modulators um, and then through uh, dispersion to put every like to put all the colors back together. What kind of phase modulators were they? Uh, they are the standard uh, lithium niobite phase modulators oh. that you can buy. Um, okay. Yes. Um, and then what did you use for the dispersive medium? For the dispersive medium, we used a grading pair because you can get a lot of dispersion that way. Oh, like a bulk optic grading? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I, I used a, a one and a half meter long fiber grating from 3M, uh, 3M's research lab at the time. I would have loved to use a fiber grating. I just couldn't, I couldn't find them many places. Mm. There aren't many places. So I didn't think actually to ask, but that's, uh, we, we definitely have a lot in common. I didn't know you worked on squeezing either. Oh, <laughs> I, I think those were the two things I, I worked on, the squeezing and the... Well, the squeezing was related to fiber gyros because it's a Sinyak loop, unlike the LIGO interferometer. That makes sense. Uh, and then the fiber grading, it, it just fell into our laps. Um, the the guy from 3M, who was an MIT grad, uh, came to visit and he said, hey, I've got a grading here I made. Do you want to play with it? And so Professor House gave it to me and I just just uh, had a blast with it that's fabulous yeah yeah it was i was just i was super talk about luck i i really was truly lucky to have that opportunity yes see sometimes opportunities happen because of luck i i really am convinced yeah all right cool so what was that three maybe um okay. i can talk about our work on orbital angular momentum <laughs> Now, 
That was the sixth part of my conversation with Juliet Gopinath. Next time, we'll get into orbital angular momentum. Juliet also teaches a free online course on active optical devices. Just go to Coursera.org and search on active optical devices or search on Juliet Gopinath. Subscribe to this podcast, and we'd really appreciate you helping to get the word out, share this with friends and colleagues that come to mind when you think of network technology and optics. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We're also on all the other major podcast platforms. You may see the Cisco Podcast Network come up when you search for Cisco Optics Podcast. That's where we live, and you can find other great podcasts there, too. Also, check out the Cisco Optics blogs at blogs.cisco.com and search on hashtag Cisco Optics blog, no spaces and no hyphens. We also have educational videos on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com and search on Cisco Optics. Thank you for listening. This is Pat Chow, product manager at Cisco Optics. The next episode is part seven of my conversation with Juliet Gopinath. Until next time, 